Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. My guests today are Arian Mack and Kian Tajbash. Arian Mack is a professor of psychology at the New School. She founded the New University in Exile Consortium, described as an expanding group of universities and colleges publicly committed to the belief that academic community has both the responsibility and capacity to assist persecuted and endangered scholars everywhere and to protect the intellectual capital that is jeopardized when universities and scholars are under assault. One of those scholars is in exile is Kian Tajbash, professor of urban planning at Columbia University. He has taught at both American and Iranian institutions. Tajbash's academic research spans theoretical and policy projects related to the culture of urbanism, as well as the governance of cities and metropolitan regions. In 2007, he was one of more than 100 people charged with fomenting the post-June 12 election unrest in a mass show trial before a revolutionary court in Tehran. He was convicted up to 15 years. He served nearly five years and was released on the implementation day of the Iranian nuclear accord Welcome to you both. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Arian, can you tell us about the uh, original formation of the University in sure. Exile Consortium? Sure. Well, uh, as some people know, but many people may not, the New School in 1933, when the first president, Alvin Johnson, was still the first president of the New School, knew and learned a great deal about the fact that Hitler was rising to power and the risk to life of Jewish academics and intellectuals was extreme. And extraordinarily, and against a great many obstacles, he initiated and started a, a rescue operation that brought uh, endangered, threatened, uh, German, largely Jewish, academic, social scientists to the United States and a, and a cadre of them were uh, placed at the New School, which had no graduate school at that point. It was primarily a, a school of adult for adult education, evening classes. And he brought them to the new school, and it enabled him to create, with kind of one fell swoop, a graduate faculty, quite distinguished, European, uh, in the social sciences. The first year of its existence, in 1933, it was called the University in Exile. The following year, it became the Graduate Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at the new school, and more recently, it's become, its name is the New School for Social Research. Now that was the original uh, university in exile. And while only a, a, a small number of uh, threatened academics were brought to the New School and stayed at the New School, Johnson had a great deal to, uh, to do with placing the other uh, 
academics who were brought to safety to the United States at other universities in the country. But he was the, he raised the money, the anti-Semitic, um, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism then. It was not easy for Jews, as many people know, to come to the United States. So he, he made this happen against great odds. Amid the suppression of intellectual life in Iran, uh, Professor, how did you link up with Aryan originally? Uh, I, uh, my first academic job was at the New School, um, which I joined in the mid-1990s. And um, after a few years uh, that I was there, and I had been working um, not on Iranian, uh, I, I was not a professor of Iranian studies, but I, I became interested in uh, doing research in Iran because of the opening up that accompanied the election of Mohammad Khatami uh, in 1997 as president of Iran. And he initiated a very far-reaching reform movement within Iran to open Iran up both to the world and to move towards a more open society. Um, so I met Aryan uh, at a time uh, at, when we were both teaching at the New School and uh, in fact, um, I first became uh, directly interested in going to Iran to do research because the president of the university at the time, uh, Jonathan Fanton, uh, had just returned from a summer trip to Iran. He had been a part of a delegation of university professors who I think had gone to Iran um, uh, uh, at the invitation of the government. And uh, when he returned, uh, he invited a delegation of Iranian diplomats to initiate discussions about scholarly exchange and uh, the possibilities of uh, expanding these kinds of university relationships. Um, after that, I decided to um, go to Iran and work on uh, research in my area of speciality, uh, which has to do with local democracy and local elections and urban planning. And that's really, that's where we met. And uh, after several years, uh, I decided to move to Iran permanently. And, uh, and while I was there, I uh, uh, agreed to become the representative of the Open Society Institute, the Soros Foundation, uh, working on democracy promotion projects. And in that capacity, I did meet Aryan when she came to Iran uh, on uh, the journal donation project. It was a project supported by the Open Society Institute to help universities around the world have access to academic journals and materials. So that's well, where I met. Let me just ask you more specifically, though. In the intro, I alluded to your incarceration, um, the trial, and the suppression of academic freedom. At what point in your relationship as a faculty, as a professor in Iran, at what point did it start going sour? And to what do you attribute um, that? Um, I, when I went to Iran, uh, I worked as an academic uh, part-time. I, I tried to apply uh, to, for a full-time position in Iranian u universities, but for a number of reasons that didn't work out, partly because um, I think of my background, uh, uh, it was hard to be vetted to be uh, accepted. It was a very long formal process. But it was also the fact that I was working, uh, as a, uh, working independently as a researcher for a number of international organizations, mm -hmm. including the Open Society Institute, the UN, the World Bank, and so forth. So I didn't want to commit full time. Okay. But I was teaching part time, and uh, I think um, uh, after a few years, when I noticed that I wasn't being invited back to teach um, as a guest lecturer, uh, um, I noticed uh, you know, there was pushback, uh, be partly because I think some of the topics that I was discussing, which had to do with um, local democracy or the expansion of democracy in various developing so societies. It, was it a threat to the theocracy in short? Um, it's important to understand uh, that Iran uh, has a very particularly ideological opposition 
to Western social science and Western intellectual uh, frameworks, philosophical frameworks. This may be different from other countries in which um, repression or restrictions have to do with politics or they have to do with emerging out of war. Um, for example, in Syria, you know, where academics uh, have to escape, uh, you know, military conflict. In Iran, the uh, government of Iran, the state, or uh, the regime in Iran, or the Nizam, as the, Iran, uh, as the Iranian state calls itself, um, has been explicit in um, its opposition to having Western-based social science being taught in the universities. So this is something which is government policy. It is explicitly um, uh, articulated by the leadership in Iran. And it, uh, and you know, the supreme leader of Iran uh, has made it a priority of his, um, of, uh, of his state um, to expunge, really. I mean, he has said very clearly that he does not want uh, social science, uh, Western-based social science, because it's based in secular assumptions and so forth, to be taught in Iranian universities. And so many academics... Um, in the years leading up to my first arrest, uh, increasingly felt these restrictions in their academic life. Arian, how does the professor's experience in Iran compare to what you're observing now and the scholars that you're bringing in? Um, well, I mean, all of them share one thing. They share the, uh, the fact that they are threatened. Uh, some of them were imprisoned. Uh, all of them, some of them fled because of war. We now have, as members uh, of the consortium, 15 scholars. They're from very different places. One is from India, where she was an activist, and she comes from a place called Manipur, where the indigenous population of which she is part have been living under martial law, and she was an activist trying to change that and had to flee. We have Syrian scholars uh, hosted by uh, consortium member, un member, member universities, and they fled for obvious reasons. I mean, they were, one was a doctor and actually was doing emergency medicine in uh, Syria and had to flee f just to s save his life. Uh, we have a scholar from the Ukraine who had to flee for other reasons, from uh, uh, Turkmenistan. So, uh, it's from really many, Cambodia. So they come from many different places, but all of them share one thing. None of them uh, were uh, able to stay where they were without either being jailed or killed. And the largest cohort are... Uh, T academics from Turkey, where uh, the Erdogan government has ruthlessly fired uh, hundreds of academics for doing no more than signing what was called or what is called the Academics for Peace petition, which was a simple declaration of, of protest against the treatment of Kurds, of the Kurdish population that lives in Turkey. And all of the Turkish scholars who are part of the consortium are signatories. There are six of them, signatories to that petition, of which there were many signatories. So the difference is, there are differences. There are obviously similarities. When we hosted Human Rights Watch director Ken Roth here, right. and this was in the months after President Trump had been elected and then inaugurated um, I asked him point blank, is this the new fascism, th this authoritarian uh, pedigree that you're describing in the countries where academics can't operate with security? Uh, you cited at the beginning of our conversation the World War II Holocaust era and um, the conditions that led to uh, Nazism. Um, what are we to make of those respective countries and what appears to be a rise in authoritarianism that is stymieing free expression and academic 
well, liberty? Okay, I'll try to answer, but I think uh, there's no simple answer because while the countries in Central Europe, like Hungary, which has now uh, done this extraordinary thing of evicting the Central European University, which is the Soros-funded American-style university that's been in Budapest now for quite a long time, and it is a graduate school not unlike the, my own at the New School. And, that, and uh, there's obviously a huge move towards uh, authoritarianism in Poland and in other places in East and Central Europe and Russia for sure. But I think that's different than the scholars who are coming from uh, Syria uh, or from places where there is no past history of uh, a, a democratic or more democratic regime. Or recent history. In, 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 well, century. even long history, yeah. but certainly recent history. So uh, the, the, I, I don't want to say that it's all due to the rise right. of authoritarianism and populism. Sure. You, say, you identify American style, um, and you said something very similar, the social sciences as taught and conceived from the American perspective. That's what's frowned upon or blocked in Iran to this day, to yes. some extent, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what is this backlash that has been decades long now, this anti-enlightenment backlash? Well, how can you make sense of it today and at all conceive of a way forward where Iran in the next decade has a climate that is more conducive to academic freedom? Um, I mean, I think it's important in the case of Iran, which I know best, um, to emphasize that uh, uh, it is, it's, it's fairly unique, uh, as far as I can see, in having a somewhat principled, I mean, it, it, it's not arbitrary uh, repression in that sense. It is, it is principled in this sense that it is formal articulated state policy that um, that the Islamic, uh, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran sees itself as uh, based on Islamic principles as interpreted by the leadership, uh, the political and the relig religious leadership in Iran. Um, the guidelines for what is acceptable in terms of uh, subjects being taught or assumptions being articulated in the university um, are quite formally, you know, they exist in formal documents. There is a Supreme Council of the, uh, of the, of the, of the Cultural Revolution, uh, and that, that official body covers edu educational curriculum, the direction of the university. The conditions on the ground did not improve subsequent to the nuclear accord. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, I mean, I think when we look back, I mean, the reason what I the reason I went back and there was a flowering of um, of of intellectual life and academic exchange uh, was during the during the period of the reform movement, in which the uh, the reformists, who are also Islamists, but they have a different interpretation of Islam, um, they uh, welcomed an, in, uh, an interchange with the Western world and with the Enlightenment thought and secular thought. Um, they didn't endorse it, but they, uh, they were open to a dialogue. Um, and uh, what became apparent to me was that uh, that wasn't welcomed by the leadership uh, of the state in, in Iran, and it went against and in fact violated their principles of what they saw, what the universities uh, should be um, uh, pursuing, and and of course, you know, the, the other important point here is that universities um, became uh, centers of uh, democratizing or liberalizing opposition to the regime, and so um, that 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 no doubt played an important role. Can you give us a more expansive view of the Middle East and how Iran? and intellectual freedom in Iran is relevant to um, the broader situation now, Saudi Arabia and, and, and other countries, and how their activity or American universities' activity in um, Qatar or 
United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, how that has at all influenced this whole conversation? Um, I, I, I would say it hasn't influenced, I mean, the kinds of activities that American universities have in the region uh, have not had uh, uh, a, well, at least they've not had a positive impact. Right. I mean, the presence, for example, of American universities in Beirut or in Cairo or now in the Gulf, uh, these are not seen as um, possibilities by the Iranian leadership or the Iranian government. That it, these are not models to be welcomed. And certainly after 2009, uh, which was the uh, big political crisis around the Green Movement in Iran, um, there is much less space for But have they improved conditions in the countries in which no. they're hosting? The answer is no. The idea of principled obstinance, uh, the theocracy and imposing its will on those universities, that's not very, in, in my estimation, it's not so different from the Eastern European regimes that are saying we endorse the idea of illiberal democracy today. Some of them, yes, that's true. Some of them, uh, I mean, certainly Orban, uh, but I think also the Orban uh, attack on CEU, on Central European University, was uh, in part a response to George Soros and the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, which is, I think, uh, now re receiving a great deal of coverage and I think is real. And I mean, I, I think it's difficult and probably a mistake to try to you know, explain everything everywhere with one story. Sure. So I, I do think that... Was uh, there another story you want to tell about your scholars today? Well, I think as I tried to say, uh, I, first of all, let me just say yeah. who are the members of the consortium. Please. Because uh, these were uh, universities I give a great deal of credit to for agreeing to join an institution that before they agreed didn't exist. So when I wrote these institutions and simply wrote their presidents and invited them to join this non-existent consortium, those that said yes, and the person who said yes first of all was Lee Bollinger at Columbia, who was a supporter from the very beginning. So right, tell right, us the they, schools. Yeah, yeah, okay, so the current members mm -hmm. are Arizona State University, Amherst, Barnard, Brown University, Columbia University, Connecticut College, Georgetown University, George Mason, Rutgers University, Trinity College, Wayne State, Wellesley College, University of Pittsburgh, and Yale, and of course the new school where uh, the whole thing is based. And we are, expect very soon to have two more members uh, we have a verbal commitment from the president of Hunter College, and it looks very much to us like Harvard will also be joining very shortly. So out of nothing, uh, we now have a really substantial group of u universities all committed to hosting a scholar. And let me just say yeah. one thing I want to say about yes. the consortium, because the consortium, this University in Exile consortium, does not have the mission of the original University in Exile, we are not ourselves rescuing and placing endangered scholars at universities around the United States. There are two organizations that do that in the United States. What we do is when the, the scholars are here and hosted by our consortium members, we try to address a problem I think no one was addressing. Namely, the sense that these scholars are airlifted in, dropped into an American university. They're safe, they're out of harm's way, but they have lost their identity, they've lost their sense of belonging. They are really suffering from exile, which is a very profound state, as many people have written about it, as how, how devastating it can be. And the mission of the university and consortium uh, an exile consortium is to cr try through various activities and conversations to really uh, create a sense of community among the hosted scholars. There is really an opportunity in the robustness of that community and dialogue for these scholars to, um, as they are in exile and safe and secure, um, think of how not only they can 
rally the spirit of the cohort, but can brainstorm together to bring solutions as much as possible, and it may not be feasible, at least not today, but to bring Absolutely. the framework of solutions to their countries. Absolutely. How, how do you think, um, from your own experience, these, these scholars can embark on that? So you and your colleagues in this cohort going forward can yes, think I mean, of I, solutions. Yes, I mean, I'd like to just, uh, I, mean, the, I mean, it's a two-step process. I mean, the first step is that once scholars have to leave their country and they arrive in the United States, um, it, the first step is for them to, in a sense, be able to put the pieces back together. Uh, many uh, the scholars are in the country for the first time, or they've been out of academia for many years, like me. And uh, I mean, I want to take this opportunity, of course, uh, thanking Arian uh, for uh, her support for all these years. The New School had a campaign for my release and for other scholars' release. And, uh, and also, President, uh, she mentioned President Bollinger, uh, the president of Columbia University, um, was one of the first to support this initiative. And uh, his idea is extraordinary, has been extraordinary in supporting uh, scholars like me in giving me a space to be able to uh, really uh, find, uh, find our feet again. Um, the second step about how then to reach out to the countries of origin, um, I think it's hard to say. Uh, um, uh, much depends on the state of uh, those countries. It much depends on uh, the possibilities of uh, diplomatic relationships that allow... There are factors outside of their control. The first step is, 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 is the one we're involved in now, and I think it's absolutely critical. It provides, uh, and, and for me, I mean, I, I mean, there are many scholars who are much less integrated into the United States academic environment than I am because I because did grad I, I graduated from right. American University, I'd lived in the US, I speak the, uh, English, um, many, many other uh, uh, exiled scholars need a sense of community to be able to um, find a way to uh, find a place for themselves in academia. And I would say that at the moment, uh, you know, um, until circumstances open up in, in the countries of origin, um, the most important thing that this initiative can do is, is allow these scholars to do their work remain viable as uh, academics and researchers. And, and one way they can do it is to work and do research on their countries. Thank uh, you both. Appreciate your time and your courage. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.